my love for the 30s can be seen, I think, in the framing, in the sets, in the costumes of the film. I think there is a real uh, visual uh, love. And uh, for me, it was a dream to be able to spend time in an atmosphere, which was the atmosphere I heard about from my parents, who were coming from that period. And it was in the movies that I loved. So with the conformist, I had the occasion to go back to that specific period of cinema. So, of course, the director of photography was uh, um, Vittorio Storaro, who I shot just a few months earlier, The Spider Stratagem. Uh, Vittorio was the focus puller in Before the Revolution, so I knew him. He was very precocious. I must say that uh, we were both very precocious. He was more or less my age. One of the main points that made the marriage between Bernardo Bertolucci and myself was the way they was used to missing scene. Uh, the putting together as a director a scene not necessarily everything uh, in, in a very conscious way for many reasons in his life he need to show always the idea through symbols uh, like in a dream like in a very mysterious way and at the same time I said Bernardo let's creating a kind of cage around this character let's use uh, the light uh, in so sharp way that there is no any embrace, no any harmony between uh, light and shadows. Bernardo loved this idea, so we decided to do all the entire part of Rome through this claustrophobic feeling. And of course, we had to have an evolution of this kind of vision. So we said, when he moved, go to France, we have to see that the light start to embrace the shadow, start to uh, not to have this kind of separation. He start to change to the, the leading character. And we should start to see maybe color. Violets, monsieur. Lovely, fresh violets. These are real Parma violets. They're really from Parma? Absolutely. Let me have one. I remember that I met this guy called Ferdinando Scafiotti, who had worked with uh, Lucchino Visconti and was the same age as us. I met him and I gave him the book, I gave him the script. Um, he was uh, very inspired. Um, together, thinking about this atmosphere of fascism, which was in the Moravia's uh, novel, we went uh, to visit EUR, which is an area of Rome built during the war. It was a kind of architectural dream of Mussolini. Bernardo loved to shoot in, in, in real location, not in a studio. We did in the studio only one scene, the, the radio station. Say because we, we have to do for Italian law to, to at least do a few uh, days in, working in Cinecetta studios. Uh, that's the only thing that really we did in studio. The rest was in real location. Oh, I've, I'm forgetting the costume designer, Gide Magrini. First time I shot with her, if she was from Milano, but she worked in the last 10 years in France. And I was completely in love with the French cinema, with what's called La Nouvelle Vague, the new wave. And to have Jit straight from the movies, I loved, it was a great privilege. I remember that one day, uh, we did an interior in Rome. There was supposed to be an apartment in Paris, but the apartment where Professor Quadri was living. And uh, Jean-Louis Trintignan was his student, arriving in, in Paris. He tried to remind to this teacher 
a concept they learn from one of his lessons, the myth of cave or plateau. Imagine a great dungeon in the shape of a cave. Inside, men who have lived there since childhood, all chained. So once we went into this set with Bernardo, Bernardo was explaining to me the concept. He says, you see, Vittorio, into this myth, uh, there are people chained into a cave. They are prisoners, and they are prisoners since the beginning of their own life. And they are forced to watch in front of themselves uh, the back end of the cave. And what they are watching? They are watching some moving shadows created by a fire behind them outside the cave. The cave. They are interrupted by people passing by with statues, with flags, with element. And those shadows uh, projected into this back of the cave are what those prisoners, those people thinking that those are reality. If you're thinking for a moment that this is a perfect metaphor for cinema. You could not have brought me from Rome a better gift than these memories, Clerici. The enchained prisoners of Plato. And how they resemble us. So I thought, but this is cinema. In fact, symbolically, the viewers are like prisoners sitting, <laughs> uh, forced to look at these shadows of the reality, because the cinema is not the reality itself, it's the shadow of the reality. While he was telling me this story, I thought of one specific painting, which was made by Michelangelo Medici, called Il Caravaggio, La Vocazione di San Matteo, particularly exactly in this kind of delineation between light and darkness. The idea that Caravaggio had, this is one of the only paintings that I know, where there is this specific separation between light and darkness, between the divine and the human being. The symbology that was used in the conformist was between light as a consciousness, darkness as unknown, so as unconscious, which was exactly the stretch of the character Somebody they have to hide something into himself, uh, something that you don't know, shouldn't know, something that you shouldn't see, so in the darkness, and something that he present to, to um, in front of him as a reality, which was the conscious side. So this specific relation in painting was for me exactly the symbol of what I was trying to do in lighting, specifically not only the character, but the entire principle of the conformist. This was the idea, and uh, we had to materialize this idea. And around the scene, there was the aura of few people very, very enthusiastic of their discovery. And that is what uh, gives to the scene a certain uh, strength and a certain um, charisma. Beautiful words, but you left and I became a fascist. Excuse me, Clerici, but a confirmed fascist doesn't talk like that. When you are behind the camera and um, you look in the hole of the camera, in the loop, um, you are a voyeur like uh, when you were a little boy, a little girl, you are going to spy on your parents' bedroom. If I weren't married, you said? Yes, I might have said that, but I am married. Doesn't mean a thing. And I think that uh, in The Conformist, when he is spying the two girls, his wife and Dominique Sander, having this kind of erotic moment together, I understood then, seeing the film, that maybe the reason why I love making cinema is because, in a way, it's the repetition of that uh, childish but very important moment. I don't remember if I've done it, but sometimes I, I, I think uh, I'm doing movies because I want to repeat that moment, or maybe the opposite. I want to do movies because I never done it as a child, and I want to be today spying in a keyhole. Oh, Switzerland, oh, Switzerland, oh, Switzerland.
The murdering of, of Professor Quadri and his wife was probably one of the most emotional sequences that we've done in, in The Conformist. And I remember that uh, we were in, in North Italy at the Betone, it was really winter time, and uh, we'd done several uh, things that we have the last afternoon for us, and after we have to come back to Rome. Our time it was over. And Bernardo said to me, Vittorio, the sequence is very complex. We've done, I think, uh, uh, all the necessary shots that we need to create in the atmosphere, the, the tension. Oh, in a way, when I saw the scene, I had that idea that a certain camera crane movement uh, following the husband who goes out of the car and then these people appear with knives, with daggers and stab him all over. Reminded me of Julius Caesar, but I felt in that moment that it was the right thing to do. You know, also the acting of Jean-Louis, who is so still inside the car, while around uh, a tragedy is happening. Even him, when he sees that the girl, Dominique Sander, runs toward the, their car, and she sees Marcello inside, and she starts knocking on the car window, and he closes completely the car. He doesn't look at her, or he, if he looks, then she understands that he's behind all this murder. And the moment she understands, her face is distorted by anguish, despair, need of revenge. And it's like a sculpture, it doesn't move. <coughs> the end of the movie is different. In the book, the conformist, his wife and the child they live in a car, like uh, escaping from the war. Now, there is an airplane, um, which uh, is uh, maybe um, of the Allies, or nobody knows in the book, which sees the car and goes down and machine guns the car, and they all die, and the conformist died there. I wasn't happy about that, so I thought, it would be much more punishing for the character suddenly when he sees the man that he thought to have killed when he was a kid alive, trying to seduce another young man. He sees him alive and he understands that all his life, all his desire to be a conformist was based on the idea that he was different because he was sex abused by this man. So this man is alive, so he hasn't killed him. He wasn't different. He has a kind of explosion. Let me know! Let me be! I want to know! Let me know! Murderer! Murderer! And I think that in the last shot of the film, when Jean-Louis Trintignant sitting turns his face toward the camera and looks you can understand that suddenly he understood the truth about himself. I like to think that I'm the last one to understand my movies, but I think it's, for me, it's better like that. I couldn't go to a set knowing already what I want to do. Being where the scene will happen in those walls, in front of these people, those bodies, those costumes, those lights. It's like that, it's always been like that.